that all of the ideas within IBLP permeate all of Christianity. I so I just wanted to pop in and say that this creator is exactly right, and I encourage you to watch this entire video. Um, I grew up in IBLP, uh, and I actually graduated from Bill Gothard's Law School, which is something I don't tell a lot of people, but now everybody knows. Um, but she's exactly right. The things that I saw in IBLP and ATI when I was homeschooled were things that I eventually saw permeate all of the non-denominational or evangelical free, in my case, Christianity that my family embraced and that I embraced at the time. Um, things like modesty, you know, in IBLP ATI, you had to wear, girls had to wear long dresses and very tight collars and whatever else, where in my regular church, you know, there were things like she says, no bikinis if you went to a, a pool or there would be, you know, some sort of length requirement on skirts and things like that. The authority structure thing was everywhere. Have you heard of complementarian theology? That's exactly what it is. It's maybe not as heightened as the Bill Gothard and IBLP version, but it's exactly the same. And uh, so, you know, again, I just encourage you to watch that and realize that Shiny Happy People is showing you something that I went through, and maybe I'll talk about it more at some point, um, but that is not foreign to other forms of Christianity, especially kind of evangelical Christianity that you find out there. Hey, I'm the evil writer. I was raised in the IBLP cult, the same one the Duggars are in in the Shiny Happy People documentary. And I'm going to talk to you about the Bible story of Deborah and how the cult taught that story to young men to make them terrible. This is going to be a two-part video. I'm going to talk in this one about the story itself and how it was taught to me, and I'm going to talk in the next one about what that meant for young men and what that did for young men. Deborah can be found in Judges chapter 4 and 5 in the Bible. The book of Judges is a book of cycles. Israel sins, they get conquered by some invading army, a judge rises up to be their leader and leads them to victory. This was before Israel had kings, so the judges were leaders in times of need. Deborah is the only woman recorded to be a judge. She was the only woman recorded to lead Israel during this time. Israel had been conquered by the Canaanites and their general Sisera. So Deborah went to Barak, who was the general of the Israeli army, and said, God wants you to fight a battle in this particular place, and God's going to be with you, and you're going to win against Sisera. And Barak said, great, I'll go, but only if you go with me. If you don't go with me, I'm not going to go. So Deborah said, that's fine, but this is going to be for God's glory, not yours, so a woman will be the one to kill Sisera. And Barak said, that's fine, let's go. They went, as so often happens in these stories, they won the battle because God was with them, the Canaanites were routed, Sisera fled. He hid out in a tent owned by a merchant who was a collaborator with Canaan, but the merchant's wife, Jael, was not a collaborator, and while Sisera slept, she drove a tent peg through his temple. This is honestly my favorite story in all of Judges. It reads like an action movie. There's lots of fun twists and turns. I really love the character of Jael. I love the fact that she was just an ordinary person who took opportunity when it was presented to her and saved the day. I really like that. But that's not how it was taught to me. Now, the cult said this was not Deborah and Jael's story. This was Barak's story. Barak, the man, was the important person here. And they focus specifically on verses 8 and 9 in the King James Version, which is the version that we all used. Verse 8 says, And Barak said unto her, If thou wilt go with me, then I will go. But if thou wilt not go with me, then I will not go. Verse 9 says, And she said, I will surely go with thee, notwithstanding the journey that thou takest shall not be for thine honor. For the Lord shall sell Sisera into the hand of a woman. And Deborah arose and went with Barak to Kadesh. I'll talk more about what that meant for young men in the next video. So I ran away from home and two weeks later I actually married the man who picked me up. This was a complete act of desperation because I was willing to do literally anything to avoid returning home. I certainly didn't want to be married to him, but I genuinely didn't think I had any other choice. I was like, if I don't marry him, I'm going to have to go back home. And then surprise, his family was also involved in the cult. So I thought he was like separate from it. He'd gotten out of it, right? Wrong. He still very much held the patriarchal beliefs. Six months into being married, 
<laughs> your girl got pregnant. But I cried for like two solid weeks after I found out I was pregnant because I was like, oh shit. Like I'm forever connected to this person and this cult. So yeah, I got out of the cult and then accidentally got back in. So I was raised in a cult and I was raised on the teachings of Mike and Debbie Pearl whose books focus on using corporal punishment on children and literal babies. But they don't stop at physical abuse because they also heavily promote psychological torture. You know, a little psychological terror is sometimes more effective than the pain. Additionally, the death of three children have been linked to this exact book. This book is still available to purchase on Amazon. And about 1.1 million of you have asked me how the hell this book is still in publication. There was a petition floating around years ago trying to get this book banned, but of course Amazon came out and said that they were not going to remove it. They also have the audacity to publish these horrific books under their publishing company called No Greater Joy Ministries. And although it would bring me no greater joy than to get this book banned, I know how these types of fundamentalists work. Any Thing that the outside world does to remove their propaganda, they look as martyrdom. And Michael Pearl's geriatric crusty ass has already come out and said that anytime his book gets in the news, even because of child murder, his sales spike. What a great stand-up guy. The only thing I would do with these lunatics book is wipe my white ass with its pages. But I honestly would rather just flush my $16.27 straight down the toilet. Welcome to America, where we will generously sell your book on physically and psychologically torturing children. And we won't tax you and we'll call it a non-profit. Purity culture inside cults is not just toxic, it is incredibly harmful. In my particular case, the teachings of the IBLP and the Gothards and Mike and Debbie Pearl's books, everything says if you are raped or sexually assaulted, it is the woman's fault because you've brought it on yourself because of something that you've done, some way that you've sinned. How did you present yourself? Did you wear something too revealing or something tempting? And what this does is when girls are put into a position where they are sexually assaulted and it is never the victim's fault by the fucking way, girls are much less likely to ever speak up about it because number one, nothing's gonna be done. Number two, it's gonna be blamed on you. Three, no one's going to want to marry you because you don't have your virginity anymore. Nothing is higher ranked for a woman to achieve than purity until marriage. For this reason in these teachings that I was molested by two of my brothers growing up and never once reported it. My parents knew about one of them and did nothing besides a little slap on the wrist for him. My family also owned a restaurant for several years and I was around 11, 12. There were multiple occasions where there was inappropriate contact made from older men that were like delivery drivers working there in some capacity. I'm being pushed up on by these older disgusting men and I have no idea what to do except I feel like it's my fault. Hey, this is part two of a two-part series on the story of Deborah from the Bible and how it was taught to young men in the IBLP cult, like myself. You can find part one on my account. Because of the emphasis on Barak, we were actually taught that Barak had sinned by asking Deborah along with him. When God told him to go fight a battle, he should have said yes, and he should have taken charge because he was a man, and he was the general, and he was in control. But instead, he deferred to a woman. And we were taught that as a consequence of this, God delivered Sisera into the hands of a woman. And we were taught that that was embarrassing. We were taught that that was bad. That Barak should have been embarrassed and humiliated to have a woman rather than him kill his rival. A lot of people have talked about how the cult teaches young men to be in charge of women and teaches women to be submissive to men and that how that fosters abuse. But we were actually taught that it was a sin to submit to a woman in any way, even if she was an expert, even if she was the judge, even if she was a prophet of God, we could not submit to women. Otherwise, it was a sin. So it wasn't just that the cult was encouraging toxic masculinity and encouraging the worst kind of people to become abusers in the cult. The cult was actually teaching us that if we did anything else, we were sinning against God. There are many kinds of people in the world. Some tend toward leadership, some tend toward following. Most people are somewhere in between, and there's nothing wrong with any of that because we need all those people. We need people to lead, to help coordinate people, but we need people to follow to actually do the work. Capitalism tells us that managers are worth more and are more worthy and deserve more pay. But the truth is the workers do all the work. Management just coordinates them. 
That's because capitalism is terrible. But we adopted that kind of idea in the cult, the idea that leaders were more valuable, leaders were better. It's not true. Leaders are just there to coordinate so the followers who do the actual work can get the work done. But we were taught that leaders were better and that we had to be leaders and that we could not ever submit to women. And that meant that if a woman tried to take control, we had to smack them down. There were mitigating factors. You were supposed to listen to women. Women were supposed to provide counsel, but never lead. And to teach that to people who do not have the personality or skills to be a good and caring leader is to turn them into abusers. And we were told that to do anything else was a sin. This is just one of the many ways that the cult screwed up young men. There's a lot of details here that I can't get to in a three minute video. Uh, if you post questions in the comments, I will try to get to them. And thank you very much for watching. The Shiny Happy People documentary series and many wonderful people, both here and elsewhere, have discussed the horrors of Bill Gothard's IVLP cult and other evangelical fundamentalist movements. Still, I've noticed that most of the focus is on stuff that either happened universally to everyone or else stuff that happened specifically to women. And I think that's where the focus should be. What happens to women in those cults are, is utterly horrific. But in the interest of filling in the gaps, I wanted to make some videos about what it was like being a young man in the IBLP cult. Uh, young men had two conflicting forces at play. On the one hand, we were being abused, at the very least mentally and physically. But on the other hand, the cult was grooming us to be the next generation of abusers. If you've been following the Shiny Happy People documentary or watching people who were in that cult on TikTok, you know about the umbrellas of protection. The father is under God, the mother is under the father, the children are under both the parents. Practically speaking, the father was under Bill Gothard and the cult, but you couldn't say that out loud because it sounded too uh, Catholic. So instead they said that the father was under God. But here's the thing. Neither God, nor Bill Gothard, nor the cult cared about abuse. And sure, they taught us to be loving. They taught us to be loving and good authorities over our wife and over our kids. But the proper response to a bad father was to obey him anyway. And trust that God would make him better, which of course never happened. So we young men were keenly aware, we were very keenly aware, that while we should treat our future wives and children well, nothing was going to happen to us if we didn't. There were no consequences. No one in the cult was going to call social workers on another cult member. Uh, no one was going to suggest divorce or separation. But there were going to be no tangible consequences. We weren't going to get kicked out. If we cheated on our wife, we might get kicked out. If we... Uh, uh, if we divorced or separated from our wife, we might get kicked out. But just for abusing or even raping our wives, nothing bad was going to happen. We weren't going to lose any status or position within the cult for that. Young men like me were subjected to physical and emotional abuse just all the time. But we were told, don't worry. It's just until you get married. Then you'll be the one in power. Not only does that do nothing to stop abuse, it perpetuates it. It causes it. I'm going to make some more videos about this later. Crimes and Grooming of Bill Gothard. Part 1 is tagged below. Bill would not stop asking his secretary intimate questions about the boy who she was with before. When they were alone in his office late at night, he asked her, were you ever intimate with this boy? When she looked confused, he asked her if they'd ever been together physically, to which she replied, yes, they'd held hands, they'd cuddled, and they kissed some. Instead of accepting that answer, he asked her, did you ever fail morally with him? When she told him no, that it had been nothing like that, he just nodded slowly and said, good, because our soul ties have to be very strong. He wanted to counsel her about this boy often. And one day while she was in his office and she was telling him about the boy, he noticed a leather bracelet on her wrist. He grabbed her arm and demanded that she tell him what it was and what it meant. She told him that it was just a leather bracelet and that when they were 15 years old, her and the boy made bracelets for each other and that he tied hers onto her wrist and she tied his bracelet onto his wrist. Bill told her that she should cut it off and she did. And once she did, he demanded that she went and threw it in the trash can. He said, and I quote, 
You are cutting ties with him. This is your new life. This is where God has brought you and he wants your whole heart. Sadly, things just got worse from there. He wanted to spend a lot of alone time with her, whether it was day trips by themselves, being in the car by themselves, or having her come up and visit him in his hotel suite. Then one day, one of Bill Gothard's sisters confronted her and accused her of wanting to marry him. The sister went off on her saying that she was just a girl and that their father would never approve and that if she wanted to marry Bill that she'd have to go about it the right way. She was very confused by the sister's aggression and accusation because to her, Bill was just her boss. On another day, she walked in on Bill yelling at a married couple and their kids were just sitting there. The couple were in tears and what had happened is that they said that they liked rock music and found nothing wrong with it, but this made Bill livid and he told them that they had completely disobeyed him. Although the couple pleaded with him that what they did wasn't that bad, Bill just kicked them out anyways. That was the first time she'd ever seen that side of Bill. The side of Bill that wasn't loving and wasn't kind and wasn't generous and it scared her a little bit. But nonetheless, he continued to groom her over the years by cuddling her, holding her hand, telling her how special she was to him, and trying to create a divide between her and her loved ones. At one point when one of her wisdom teeth began to hurt, he had a dentist come to the institute. And that dentist told her that he'd have to shave some of her jawbone down to get the tooth fixed. And many years later, she would find out that that dentist was fired from malpractice and didn't even have a license. But Bill let him work on her and multiple other staff members and children at the Institute. Whole documentary is being framed as just being like an IBLP problem. Stuff like this really makes me wonder how exhausted Jesus would be if he was still on the earth because of the amount of tables that he would have to flip. I watched the whole documentary. I thought it was fascinating because especially to like, I used to watch them when I was younger and be like, oh my God, like, how could you not kiss till marriage? That's like so interesting. But despite the fact that I grew up religious, I grew up with parents who were normal and who had those conversations with me that a lot of people are saying their parents didn't have. Like we talked about anatomy. I knew how my body worked. I knew, you know, the stuff that a lot of people are being sheltered from and that these doctrines and this stuff don't talk about. And I have a lot of opinions about that that I could share, but I'm going to keep that for another video. But it really is a huge perpetual problem, and it turns so many people away from the church when that really isn't what it's supposed to be about. And, like, I completely understand why, because obviously I lived it, but I feel so bad when people don't end up in the church because their experience growing up was so hyper fixated on this is what's wrong with you, this is how you should dress, do you see how that person's dressing, like where that's your association with Christ and not Christ. And that obviously isn't their fault. But if we as a body don't talk about it and we don't make an effort to remedy that issue, we're just going to keep repeating the cycle. One of the things I took note of too in the documentary was in one of the pamphlet pages they shared where it was talking about like avoiding the lustful eye or whatever. It quoted Proverbs 7, but it quoted a very small section of the passage. And the section it quoted had something to do with like she will lure you into temptation, like, you need to avoid it, whatever. But if you read the whole passage in its entirety, it talks about this man who is wandering on the street and is lost, and how all the men are, like, in this house, and how they're, like, come back, and he's kind of like, no. And then he goes out anyway. Meanwhile, he's choosing not to go back, he's choosing to stay on the street, whatever, and the lustful woman takes him in, and he's drawn into temptation. But instead of highlighting his choice to leave the safety of wherever he was, and to stay, like, in the will of God, I would assume is the metaphor, he chooses to leave. And while everybody implores him, is like, don't, he chooses to leave. And they make it seem like, oh, this woman drew him there, where like, he chose to do that. And the man, much like ourselves, he wasn't helpless. He had a whole body of people saying, come back, be safe. And he chose to go. He chose to be led astray. And I'm not saying we're not human by any means. Obviously we all make mistakes. Not all of us choose to make mistakes or to go a certain way. But it's the idea that she drew him away instead of he chose to leave and he chose to be drawn away. And I really hope that this is one step towards self-awareness and an even bigger step towards creating a church where we can heal and not create those same mistakes for our kids. Okay, so I was cleaning out some of my stuff today and this is the notebook I've been using to like keep track of what I wanna talk about on this TikTok. But I also <laughs> <laughs> I'm grab this from my parents' house. This is like the main, one of the main books that Bill Gothard recommends that he hasn't written. Um, he loved these guys, but it's so ironic because 
It says, learn how to maintain fellowship with your child, wrong, spank less, wrong, and get total obedience, right. So this book explains how to basically break down their spirits until they just become like mindless zombies and obey authority. But I'll go through it and read some crazy stuff <laughs> to y'all at some point. Then I found this magazine I've kept since 2014 because it was the first time I ever saw anyone that looked like me growing up on a magazine <laughs> so I kept it and even then their their faces have been airbrushed and made up but they still look like me it's like okay sorry this is just a video of my computer but I just wanted to point out that IBLP has just rebranded they've rebranded into family conferences um it's the same thing though so <laughs> panel of five white guys who talk about the bible who gives a fuck brandon somebody who cares and the panel of whatever the hell they're doing again who cares anyway affirming biblical foundations literally the same the same materials the same topics the same ideals nothing has changed this is bill gothard's writings renamed rebranded held at Big Sandy, Texas, his, um, one of his, uh, training centers. Um, so yeah, just rebranded. How fun is that? Ugh. I read Ginger Duggar Volo's book. It sucks. That's pretty much all you need to know about it. Okay, fine. I'll explain. It's hard to really say who this book is for because she claims it's for people who were hurt by the teachings of Bill Gothard. And to be fair, she goes after Gothard quite a bit. She names him by name. She calls out his teachings. Good for her. So he's the primary antagonist of the book. The secondary antagonist is people like me. No, seriously. People like me who grew up in the same cult, who ended up not having any faith in Jesus. Because ultimately, this isn't a tell-all book. This isn't a memoir. It's a theological memoir, according to her. And according to the best friend of theirs who just so happens to be a higher up at the seminary that her husband attends that's run by some very bad people. You see, Ginger didn't write this just because people were hurt by Bill Gothard. She wrote this because she saw people leaving the faith because of Bill Gothard. I am such a person who left the faith, rather obviously. But I didn't just decide to do that overnight. And the way that she paints the experience of people like me who struggled to hold to their faith, who spent hours and hours and days trying to figure out the trauma that they had been through, who genuinely tried to find a way to make Christianity work for them and ultimately just could not anymore. She writes it off as people who took the easy way out, wanted total freedom for their lives, as if that's a bad thing, and basically invalidates the experience of those of us who didn't end up in the same place she did. And look, as an atheist creator, I do try to make it very clear that people who leave abusive situations often end up in different places. I support those who end up in places that are supportive and that are non-harmful, no matter if they're theists or not. And I know I disagree with some of my fellow atheists on this, but it's true. At a certain point, so much trauma has been done that even incremental progress to live a healthy life, I'll take it. Am I vocal about my beliefs and the beef I have with Christianity? Sure. But I'm not going to say that someone else's journey is invalid just because of where they ended up. Unless it is in a place that is just as harmful as what they left. And for various reasons that I've covered on this app and elsewhere, what Ginger Dogervolo is in right now is a harmful conservative Christian nationalist church that is not that much different from IBLP. The clothes look different, the clientele is different, but the core teachings are just as bad. And I hate that the mainstream's first real look into Bill Gothard is going to be tainted as this infight between differing camps of conservative Christianity, and at the same time she invalidates those of us who are genuinely trying to help take down IBLP as well. Trust me, you're better off skipping this one.